And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Professor Steve Keen. Steve is, of course, Professor of Economics at Kingston University in London. Steve's also been probably one of the most uh, prolific and popular guests that we've had in the program. So if you enjoy today's interview, I strongly recommend that you go back. Steve's been, I think, either two or three times on the program before, and those interviews are as relevant today as they were when they were recorded. So, Steve, I think we should start with the French elections because that's been on everybody's mind, and you certainly are in the right neck of the woods t- uh, to cover that. Well, how do you see both the situation with the first election going the way that it did and probably more importantly in terms of the follow-on how does this frame the overall picture of european contagion risk you know are we still looking at brexit having been the beginning of the end for the eu or would a macron victory maybe uh, suggest the the things are coming back together no i think macron is just a continuation of Hollande by another name uh, and somebody who actually supports uh, neoliberal economic policies rather than being forced to do them as the land was done by the European Union and its Maastricht Treaty rules. Um, so uh, whatever, you know, the, the, because the issues are still there with the euro, uh, hobbling France, the, the, all the policies, the limitations on government deficits, the attempt to cut spending with austerity and so on, and every when you attempt to save at that level, every dollar you save is actually a dollar less in GDP because a dollar less expenditure is a dollar less income. Uh, so it's totally counterproductive policies uh, because Macron's likely to follow those policies and actually enhance them with his ideas to sack large numbers of public servants and try to balance the budget even faster. He'll simply ex- amplify the support for uh, Le Pen at the next election if she loses the runoff election. Uh, and, of course, that's still not necessarily a given because even though the polls called this election very accurately, uh, the next one depends upon who turns up to vote for their l- l- less unpopular candidate. And the only if, if Le Pen is guaranteed to have her full support continued, uh, there's no necessary guarantee that Macron is going to pull support either from the centre right or the uh, centre to extreme left. And he needs to do that to beat uh, Le Pen in the next round. So, but if he doesn't, uh, she'll be back in five years' time stronger than ever. And how do you feel about the prospects for the European Union in general? Oh, it's it's. It was, I always describe it as a suicide pact written by the leaders of Europe when they first signed off on the Maastricht Treaty. It's a question of how long the suicide takes and what the, what the, what the weapon is going to be uh, for self-destruction. Will it be France? Will it be Italy? But, and could it even be Germany? Because there are so many German, uh, very conservative savers who find they're getting zero returns and they're blaming it on the euro and quite rightly so. So it's quite possible one of those three factions, the, the, the rising right in Germany or, or the any group, in France or Italy, and particularly in Italy, the uh, uh, Five Star Movement, that could be enough to bring the euro unstuck, and it simply has to go. The whole, the the, 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 the ideal of the European Union is wonderful. The execution has been almost the opposite of the ideal. And where do you see the U.S. dollar going from here? A lot of people are starting to say, okay, this is it, the rally's over, U.S. dollar's, you know, we're going to roll over and watch out. Ninety is next. Uh, are we seeing the end of the dollar rally, or is this just a pause that's set to resume? No, oh, I think in turn, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like calling short-term uh, movements in the currency, but the strengthening of the euro because people saw uh, Le Pen probably being defeated in the next round. Uh, there's, there's still there's certainly going to be room for volatility on that on that play when the second round occurs. But my feeling is that once the um, once it's obvious, let's say Macron does win, once that happens, the euro is going to weaken. If Le Pen wins, the euro is going to crash. So I'd be, I'd be uh, getting ready to, um, to short the euro after, not that I'm going to speculate in currencies, by the way, but if I was, my, my position would be expecting the uh, euro to fall shortly after the election. It could rise for a while with Macron, but once the, um, once the realisation set in that his policies were not going to save France... Uh, they're going to actually continue pushing it further down the euro euro hole, uh, then the euro is going to start declining once more. And U.S. equity market, we uh, are looking, we should probably let our listeners know that we recorded this interview several days early, so we may not have the latest data, but we're still just fighting with the previous uh, high of 2,400 on the S&P. Looks like Donald Trump's tax plan may be the catalyst to push us even to new all-time highs. Do you see this equity market continuing, or are we getting to the point where maybe we're running out of steam here? Well, the equity market's been powered by quantitative easing. 
until Donald came along when it's becoming powered by Donald easing. Now, um, it's massively overvalued in any historical trend. If you take a look at uh, uh, Schiller's lagging price-to-earnings ratio, the level of the S&P right now has, has only got two periods where it's been exceeded. Uh, one is the rally, the, the enormous bubble we now know where the 2000 rally was when the PE hit almost 45 to 1. It's currently 29.41 to 1, and that is almost exactly equal with the, light, with the only other peak that stands out, which is Black Tuesday in 1929. That's, so it's that level of overvaluation. Um, and but it will continue as long as QE continues. Now, if Donald, if the Donald rally goes on for a bit longer because of that huge boost to um, after-tax revenue for American corporations, but the uh, Reserve then tries to tries to tuck QE out. I see QE as a pack with the devil, a bit of a Faustian bargain. You can't not continue doing it. And if they do pull out, I think the market will fall because of that, regardless of what uh, the Trump rally does. So uh, we're going to we're going to see massive volatility as the, as the Fed tries to extricate itself from a deal it really can't leave. Let's move on to the U.S. Treasury market and fixed income in general. A lot of notable people have suggested that the 35-year bond bull market is over, ended last summer, and that it's all uphill from here in yield. But, of course, in the last few weeks, we've seen what is certainly at least a pullback in, in yields, if nothing else. How do you see this? Are we looking at a structural end to the bull market in bonds, or are we just taking a pause here as well? I think we're just taking a pause because, again, what's actually driven – the decline in yields, which of course rise, increases the value of the bonds, is the rising level of private debt, meaning that the world economy simply can't tolerate anything much above a zero rate of interest. And this is what the Federal Reserve itself does not realise, because it's still it swallowed the neoclassical blue pill. It still believes the delusional world of neoclassical economics, in which you can completely ignore the private sector level of debt that's irrelevant to macroeconomics in their in their little um, matrix world. Now, when you know that it actually is a crucial indicator, then with the debt as high as it is now, any increase in yields is going to make a lot of people unable to service the debts they've currently got. Certainly mean they won't continue borrowing money, so credit demand will evaporate once more and you'll fall back into a slump again. So I think the only real uh, – I wouldn't see it as a secular shift. I'd see it's the proof that America, after the financial crisis, has turned Japanese, and I expect a very much a Japanese-style history for the bond market from now on. And so that would mean what specifically? We're looking at decades of economic stagnation, slow growth, and very low interest rates? Yeah, until such time as we get a serious political shift, in, in similar in the sense to what we're seeing and happening in Europe under the euro. Um, and, and Donald Trump is clearly not that shift as people thought he might be. Um, but yeah, they're going to put, start putting rates up because the, the Federal Reserve believes in its own little uh, deluded head that the rate of interest should be 4%. That's their target because they believe that there are three magic numbers for the economy, a 2% rate of inflation, a 3% rate of economic growth, and a 4% reserve rate of interest. And that's what they're trying to target back to. And as they head back in that direction, every step they take towards that level will mean that there's more likely to be an end to the credit-based rally that's taking place in the States right now. And when that's, when that's done, that is effectively back down again to dropping rates uh, and yields falling and bond prices rising once more. And that's the sequence I see them going through indefinitely because they still don't understand what actually drives the economy. Well, on this subject of private debt, I know you've done a tremendous amount of work on that subject. How do you see this playing out? Because while you and I and uh, many of our listeners agree that we have way too much private debt and that's the real problem, it seems like nobody who's pulling the strings gets it. If you look, Fannie Mae just announced that they're going to institute new innovative rules to make it possible for lenders to ignore overburdened student loan debt uh, and be able to issue loans that they – or mortgages, I should say – that they should not have issued otherwise if they were considering the actual facts. This is the, the government policy era that we live in. So it looks like this growth of private debt, meanwhile, uh, margin interest is at record highs and growing. We're seeing retail coming back into the stock market and buying on leverage. The The private debt continues to just be out of control. But how does this eventually end? What What is the eventual uh, event or, or mechanism that causes this to all unwind? And how does it look? Well, to me, the mechanism is the uh, government finally learning how capitalism operates, but as long as they're listening to the neoclassicals, they'll never understand that. 
Um, so what I see happening is effectively imagine that there's a, a debt ceiling in America which is actually a serious and real one, and that's the private debt ceiling. And you put that at 170% of GDP, because that's the peak level that was reached back in 2010. It's since fallen to 150%. It's now rise, 100, 145%, I think. It's now rising. It's back up to about 150% once more. But the closer it gets to that ceiling, the less momentum it has, and therefore you can go from rising debt to reaching a peak and then falling back down again. And when that decline in the rate of growth of debt occurs, that's a decline in credit, demand will evaporate, and all the confidence that the economy is recovering will disappear from the legislators and the regulators. They will then start dropping rates rather than raising them. So this is the game that Japan's been playing with itself for 15 years. That's a very unintentional pun, but I'll let it hang in the air there. Uh, I think the Americans going to do the same thing. And if I look at the uh, the credit dynamics for America right now, I'm just looking at one of the charts on my Prof. Steve Keen website where I've got the uh, all the charts from my new book up there, plus a few others. Uh, the peak level of credit, which has changed in private debt in America, occurred to, in 2008. That was 15% of GDP. It fell to minus 5% in 2010. It's now hit 7%, but if you look at the data, it's starting to turn back down to negative again, or rather declining once more. Uh, so it's never going to reach the level of credit demand that occurred before the crisis. And you'll continue fluctuating up and down with a policy being driven in the opposite direction and not quite knowing why they're reversing, but being forced to by circumstances. Steve, I want to move on to some of the geopolitical risks that are growing around the world. Why don't we start with the North Korean situation? You know, obviously this guy is uh, threatening the United States openly and uh, alluding to preemptive nuclear strikes. A lot of people would like to think that they're not capable of doing that, but of course they, they are doing missile launches and tests. What does this mean for financial markets? Uh, what, what are the potential risks and where do you see the situation with North Korea going? Oh, North Korea is always doing doing this. It's always being belligerent and blustering, and it's it's a bit like the smallest guy in the class um, throwing a temper tantrum every time the bully comes anywhere near him to tell the bully to back off. Uh, you know, get too close, I'll smash your smash your kneecaps in, and that's pretty much what's being said to America for the last you know forty years. Uh, the sensible thing is the bullies normally thought if I throw a if I throw a punch in this guy. Uh, obviously, I'll win, but he might actually break my kneecap before that happens, so I will back off. Um, Trump doesn't seem to understand that. So it does scare me that uh, we could actually see something preemptive occurring. I don't think it will. I, I think that all the uh, limitations that are set there in terms of when you can de declare, I think, DEFCON 3 before you can actually launch a nuclear strike, that rules out, I hope, preemptive recognition by Trump. On the other side, with the little North Korean hairdo man, um, equally, this is just the usual tactic. Be belligerent, threaten Armageddon to maintain your domestic uh, control. I think the best thing you can do to understand this is read, go and get, can get a copy of 1984 and read what was being said uh, by the various, you know, the, the three parts of the world, uh, all the uh, bluster they would do uh, to maintain a power without actually having to go to war with each other. So I hope that's what's happened in that situation. It'll just become a sideshow. But uh, because every time he increases the range with which he can uh, throw a missile or throw, throw a weapon, then the more likely it is Americans might try something foolish like a preemptive strike. Because from everything I understand uh, about North Korea's military capacity and the distance to Seoul, it could do... <laughs> it would certainly wound very, very heavily. It really would break that kneecap. I agree with you completely, and I, I hope that it stays the sideshow that we want it to be. I'll tell you, though, the, the one that concerns me more is the risk of the Syrian situation escalating to the point where it becomes a U.S.-Russia conflict. And I, I'm shocked by the number of U.S. politicians that are talking openly about basically wanting to start a war with Russia. I, I think a lot of Americans have forgotten that when you go pick a fight with you know, Afghanistan or something, they're not very able to defend themselves. Russia is quite able to... Uh, to have a nuclear war, and uh, I, I'm very concerned. They, they've threatened now. Russia has said that if the U.S. repeats something like the Tomahawk missile strike on Syria, which they felt was completely unjustified, that they would respond with force. We have Russia threatening to respond to the United States with military force. That scares the heck out of me. How, how do you see the situation, and, and where do you think it's headed from here? No, I mean, sometimes I see a, a match between a checkers player and a three-dimensional chess player, and no prizes for guessing which one I think is which. Um, so I'm just hoping that whatever provocation uh, happens to happen in Syria, which, of course, people who voted for Trump thought they wouldn't be after needing to discuss anymore, that would have only happen under Hillary. Uh, I hope that whatever provocation, uh, Putin is intelligent enough to completely uh, outstep them. 
and ended strategically in his advantage without a large loss. That seems to be how he operates. And uh, But again, you're dealing with a total wild card in terms of what's going to drive Trump's behavior and how much does that fit into what the military industrial complex actually uh, you know, wants to do. And maybe they want a military strike there. But it, it is beyond the level... It, it's... I mean, I, how can you actually discuss global politics when it comes down to the um, ego level of a, of a leader who is totally inexperienced in playing games on this scale versus one who, of course, is incredibly experienced and has been quite successful for the last 20 years? Let's go back to economics, probably a more refreshing. The, the, the massive explosion of, of debt in China that threatens to uh, cripple the economy. Now, that's a pleasant topic compared to Russia and the United States. But you are an expert, of course, on debt and the problems that come from excessive debt. Kyle Bass has suggested that the situation with the explosion of leverage and debt in China since 2008 is setting up a situation that might force the uh, – the Chinese to devalue the yuan in a massive way, potentially sending a wave of deflation around the world. And of course, there's a lot of different views as to whether or not that's realistic. How do you see this? Is that a realistic scenario that Mr. Bass uh, paints or is he completely out to lunch? No, I think it's actually pretty much on the money there because the only thing that got China through the crisis back in 2008 was an incredible increase in private credit. If you um, look at the the first impact of the global financial crisis on China, it was something like about a 40% fall in its exports volume, exports volume very, very sh- rapidly. And what that meant was that the factories, which are mainly along the, um, the coastal cities in China, were forced to lay people off. And when they laid them off, most of them didn't have work permits to actually be in those cities. They were forced back to the countryside. So the scale of political chaos that meant for China was enormous, and they had to get a, a rapid stimulus in there. Now, what they did was, because the state banks are pretty much actually government-owned banks, uh, and also because in, a, in China, if somebody, if an official tells you to do something, it's very good for your health to follow the instructions. So um, the level of credit in, Japan, in China as a percentage of, of GDP was about 20% when the crisis began. It fell, uh, as it would have done because of the lack of demand for investment in that stage, towards 15%, and then the directive hit, and it went from 15% of GDP to 38% of GDP in one year. That was the increase in credit. Now, it's, it's fallen back from that peak, but it's still after you know, peaking at almost 40% of GDP in 2010. It has never fallen below 20% of GDP, and it's now bouncing between 28 and, and, and 30% of GDP. Uh, that's given China, its, it's debt level has gone from about 100% to 200% in just about eight years, an enormous scale, one of the, probably the, probably the biggest bubble uh, in financial history in terms of the volume of money we're talking about here. Now, that's reaching, well, it's gone, I think, well past capacity. There are lots of loss-making loss ventures in China now, courtesy of that enormous level of leverage. And it has to end. You, you won't go ch- see China going much beyond reported level of, say, 225% of GDP is its private debt level. It's currently about 210. And when that happens, the credit-based demand disappears, and we're talking about demand equivalent to roughly one quarter of the size of the world's second largest economy. Now, that's huge. That's uh, like $2.5 trillion of demand will disappear from the global economy as that decline in credit starts. And can the Chinese government counteract that with its own spending. Now, it's far more likely to move into that than the any Western democratic nation because they just simply don't face the, the, the legislative and parliamentary limits on their behaviour. And it's always it's it's been a centrally directed system. So to go to, back to government spending being the driving force is you know, like returning to mama. So I can see them doing it, but they can't avoid a credit crunch in the meantime. Now, that means that in the next one or two years, you're likely to see a serious decline in China, comparable to what happened at the time of the global financial crisis itself, and then attempts to reverse it. And in that situation, the currency going down and the, the government actually trying to, to assist that along its way uh, by selling its own currency, uh, which it has enormous capacity to do, then you could see that deflationary shock come through the rest of the global economy starting around, say, 2020.
So it sounds like a credit crisis in China could indeed be the catalyst that might lead us to another financial crisis or another global systemic uh, situation. That, of course, begs the much broader and overarching question of can the world avoid another financial crisis? And it is, of course, timely that we ask you that question because you've just published a book by that exact title, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? That is available right now on Amazon in the UK only, and it sounds like about me mid-May before it will be uh, available for order through Amazon in the United States. Uh, we will get an email out in our, reg- in our weekly research roundup email. When it is possible to order that book in the United States, we'll send the Amazon link at that point to our listeners. So our U.S. listeners will have the uh, ability to do it. But let's get a preview right now for those who aren't able to see the book yet. Uh, can we avoid another financial crisis? Our listeners who have heard your prior interviews know the answer is no. But let's, <laughs> let, let's give them a, a little bit more for their money than that. Why is the answer no? Okay, the answer is no because it, it's actually it, it's 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 a complicated no. If it was straightforward, no, I would have written a, a two word two word book rather than a um, a twenty five thousand word one. But the the basic cause is that total demand in the economy is the sum of the turnover of existing money plus credit. And uh, eventual economics tells you you can ignore credit. That's why they didn't see the financial crisis coming. It's why I did see it coming. Uh, now, if that's the basis, the turnover of existing money plus credit is your sort of sort of total expenditure, which therefore becomes income, then if you have a rising level of private debt to, to income, at some point, uh, for a range of reasons, and I, I elaborate these in the book, uh, you then have people not willing to take on any more credit. Credit the credit to get uh, to the income level plateaus, and when it plateaus, credit, which is the change in debt, goes to zero. And of course, if you have people trying to pay their debts down or they're going bankrupt, then credit actually becomes negative. So what was a positive contribution to demand in the lead up, once you reach the saturation point, becomes either zero or negative. And America had that classic experience of going from credit being 15% of GDP to minus 5% over a two year period. Now, once you've done that, if you try to reduce your debt by paying it down, by earning more, by growing faster, yada, 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 you find you can't do that. And what then happens is each attempt to reduce your debt level by paying debt down actually destroys the money that you repay that debt with. And that reduction in capacity to spend reduces your income as almost as much or more in some cases, uh, given massive, de- given large levels of deflation, reduces your income more than it reduces your debt level. So your debt ratio either remains constant or rises. And you can be stuck there uh, without a little event like, for example, the Second World War. You can be stuck there indefinitely. Now, China, Japan gives us the best instance of that. Japan uh, hit its crisis in 1990 because of the momentum of debt still rising and, and GDP actually falling at that stage. The debt ratio continued to rise till about 1992 or three. It peaked at 225 percent of Japan's GDP. It sat down to about 165 percent, so they've cut it by roughly a quarter. But that still gives it a debt level which is probably one and a half times as much as that economy should be carrying. And therefore, nobody wants to borrow money for investment. Investment is less than, less than it needs to be to cause the economy to grow or to have the, the firms being able to finance innovation, and the economy becomes stagnant. Now, America joined that same situation 18 years later with this crisis in 2008. Several other economies did the same thing. The Netherlands, obviously, uh, Spain, very obviously, uh, Ireland also, the UK, though it didn't actually realise it had done this. And they're all what I call the walking dead of debt. They're carrying so much debt, private debt, that they are not investing, they're not growing. They therefore stam- stumble on with only one real source of demand, all the turnover of existing money. And that, because of the situation of a, of a, um, a, a long-running slump, that happens even more slowly again. So even that turnover slows down. So they're the walking debt of debt. But there are countries that appeared to get through the crisis in 2008 with flying colours, South Korea and Australia being the two most outstanding examples because they were the only two OECD nations not to record a, re- a technical recession, two, two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Uh, they got through it by increasing their leverage. So Australia's running at about, for having, having hit about 180% when the crisis occurred, it's now about 210%. It's got the second most over-indebted households in the world. The only ones that beat them are the Swiss. And with that level of, of debt, they're going to hit a ceiling in the next two or three years, more likely the next one year for the housing sector. And that's the end of credit demand there. They, they'll go from being what I call the, uh, or they, they, they managed to cheat the crisis, but they're now what I call the zombies to be. And 
in terms of the countries I identified, the major countries, China, obviously, uh, Canada, almost certainly, South Korea, Australia, and then a range of unexpected countries like Belgium, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, and so on. The Netherlands has got the capacity to both be the walking dead of debt and a new zombie all at once. Steve, you did your PhD thesis modeling uh, Hyman Minsky's uh, economic models, and you're obviously one of the leading experts in the world on this whole Minsky cycle. So what I'd like you to do is, first, for anybody who may not be familiar with Minsky's work, give us a quick overview of the Minsky uh, model, but particularly what's always fascinated me, people talk about the so-called Minsky moment when all of a the sudden there's a tipping point and everything changes. What causes that boom-bust cycle to switch from boom to bust and that Minsky moment to be triggered? What, are there something that you can look for? Or are there signals in the economy that tell us when it's coming? How do you know how to interpret this? Yeah, good question. Uh, the starting point is that asking what question did Minsky ask himself that led to his hypothesis? And this is one thing I'll start the, the new book with uh, by talking about the attitude that mainstream economists had to the economy, believing not only they understood how the economy operated, but they were managing it so well there would never be another crisis. And you're getting pronouncements like that up to and including June of 2007, uh, two months before the crisis actually began. So Minsky, rather than the reason they reached that answer, by the way, was they thought the important economic question is, can we derive macroeconomic theory from microeconomics? That's what occupied the minds of so-called leading Nobel Prize winning economists for the last 40 years. Minsky asked himself a completely different question. He posed it first really in the 1950s, and that was, can a Great Depression happen again? And if so, why hasn't one happened so far? And he's writing in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. And to me, that was a far more sensible question to ask about capitalism. And having asked it, it makes you focus upon elements of the real world that the mainstream completely left out of their theories. So to make their theories more tractable, their simplistic 19th century mathematics they think is sophisticated, they left out the existence of money. Now, most people think economists must be experts on money. No, they persuaded themselves you can ignore money and model capitalism and derive your monetary variables as extension of the real phenomena you think are happening with money just being a veil over barter. So they left out money, they left out banks, they left out debt, and they therefore were completely blindsided when a crisis caused by money and banks hit them uh, in, the, in 2007. But Minsky's perspective was to say, well... Capitalism is inherently cyclical. Now, that's, that itself is a shift because the neoclassicals say capitalism is in equilibrium, which is not, not a capitalism I've ever experienced in my lifetime, but that's their vision. Start from equilibrium. Minsky said it's always cyclical. They then said let's leave banks, debt and money out. Minsky said banks, debt and money are crucial. So he said how do banks, debt and money interact with an inherently cyclical nature of capitalism? And his idea was very, very simple. It's beautifully easy to, to uh, portray, unlike neoclassical theory, which involves talking about utility curves and all this sort of nonsense. So Minsky said, uh, take some point in history shortly after there's been a financial crisis when the economy appears to be doing okay in the aftermath. The longer you go from the crisis point itself uh, with tranquil economic conditions, the more people tend to forget the previous crisis and think, oh, thank God that's over, and then start to revalue assets on the basis of extrapolating forward this period of relative tranquility. And as they do that, they're more willing to borrow money. And when they borrow money, the extra money causes the economy to grow. And so there's a positive feedback between that change in expectations as you forget the previous crisis to growth. So what Minsky said was the fundamental instability of a capitalist economy is upward. The tendency to turn doing well into a speculative boom is the fundamental weakness of a capitalist economy. Now, that is a very different vision, a critical vision of capitalism, which criticizes on the basis of one of its strengths. And that's not what the usual critics do. They normally focus on what they see as some sort of weakness. But Minsky said, no, because capitalism will both generate signals that give you an increasing desire to invest and provide you with the means to finance that investment, then it has this positive feedback loop, as engineers would describe it, that leads to a bubble forming out of a period of relative tranquility. So that's pretty much what you can see happening, say, back in from 1992 at the end of the last Great, uh, great Recession before the, the really great one, and off you go on a bubble at that point. Now, what then happens is that as, as firms begin to in, borrow more money to invest, they cause the economy to grow more rapidly. That reduces unemployment. It also makes 
resources more uh, essential and the prices of labor and resources start to get bidden up. At the same time as firms have taken on additional debt to finance investments, so their debt levels have gone up as well. So they're suddenly forking out more money to three other social groups, resource producers, workers and bankers. And the rate of profit they were expecting to get when they began doing this investment is less than they anticipated. In fact, the increased costs of those three increased costs can actually eliminate their profit margins. Uh, so at the, almost the peak of the boom, they stop investing because they're losing money or they're not getting the return they wanted. Investment slows down. That slowdown in investment finally translates through with a lag to the change in prices for commodities and for, and for labour. And as that decline goes on now, as you go from a boom to a slump and declining share going to workers and going to, uh, bank, to, to um, for raw material re- resources, part of the return to bankers doesn't fall as much because it's based on the increase in debt that's come out of that bubble. So the debt level level's risen. They're getting a larger share of income as the other two social classes see their share decline. And then when you get to the, that, that it, it reaches a new point where the rate of return to capitalists has got back to the level that stimulated them to invest in the first place. But that now involves a larger share going to bankers and back to a smaller share going to workers and to raw material providers. So another boom takes off again, but it starts from a high level of private debt. So that keeps on happening several cycles. And you finally get to the point where there's such a level of private debt taken on, such a reduction in income going to workers in particular, and also prices for raw material suppliers, that when the boom starts, uh, and with, with this much, much higher level of debt, the increase in the share going to the raw material producers and the workers can eliminate that profit very rapidly and therefore at that point firms again try to go through the same old process but they owe so much money having accumulated all this debt compared to income through a series of booms and busts they can't delever they can't pay down their debt and you go into a period where there's declining nominal debt but rising ratio of debt to gdp and you have a, unless you have a massive scale of bankruptcies wiping out that debt or some government spending to make up for the decline in private cash flows you have a great depression and that's, that's the Minsky moment. It's when you reach that point where so much is going to the bankers that the, what's left over for capitalists after they've paid their wages and their raw material costs is actually possibly negative and the economy will just continue descending into a crisis. If you look at the housing markets in Canada and Australia in particular, a lot of people feel that they're in bubbles and you know out of control in terms of excessive valuations. Certainly in some U.S. cities, that's true. San Francisco has seen just so much money coming out of China that their property values have been pushed way up. So what actually causes housing bubbles to pop? Is it just a relationship of personal income to affordability of debt service, uh, or is it something else? It's more complicated. I mean, the, the wild card of that enormous demand coming in from China uh, is something which we haven't had to deal with before. And uh, the, the scale of increase in profit, the scale of wealth that's been generated there is so great that people have got a, a strong encouragement to buy in what they see as politically safer areas and also buy you know, cities that actually have blue sky above them rather than smog everywhere. So that's an initial wild card. But the basic causal mechanism that drives house prices is actually mortgage debt. And this is why we we get trapped uh, by a little trick in mortgage debt, which leads the causation of house price bubbles forming and then also them bursting to be the opposite of what people actually think they are. So this is slightly hairy logic, but I'll see if I can talk it through on the radio. If you imagine what the monetary demand for housing is, it's fundamentally new mortgages, more than 90%. In the, in, when you particularly get into a bubble, more than 90% of the money that's used to buy a house is borrowed money. That's, that is new mortgage debt, which is therefore change in the level of existing mortgage debt. Now, if you want to convert that into how many, what's the flow of demand per year for standardised houses, you divide that by, that by the price index so that new mortgages, which is change in mortgage debt, divided by the price level gives you the number, the, the flow of demand for houses per, per year at one particular point in time. Similar thing I can do on the supply side, but I'll leave it at that for the demand side now. So you get a relationship between change in mortgage debt and the level of house prices. It takes a bit of mathematics to work it further than this, but the, the final punchline is that what causes rising house prices is change in mortgage credit, where mortgage credit is change in mortgage debt. So you get a relationship between acceleration of mortgage debt and, and change in house prices. And what it means is that 
you now have to look at the acceleration of mortgage debt to know when there's going to be a turning point in house prices. Now, here I'm going to get really hairy, so I hope people cope with this logic. If you imagine that there's some base level of mortgage debt to GDP, which is when there's a totally stable economy, you might have, say, the, the ratio of mortgage debt to GDP being, GDP being say, 20%. So mortgage debt is 20% of GDP. If you hit a peak level, America was uh, was below 100%, but just, let's just say the peak level is, say, 100% of GDP. Then if you connect this through over time from the 20% low level to the 100% peak, you get an elevated S. And the slope, of the, the S, the slope of that S is the rate of change of mortgage debt. Now, that will peak halfway up the hill. If you're starting in the valley at 20%, rising to the, you know, the plateau at 100%, then halfway up that slope is the maximum rate of growth of mortgage debt or ch- change in new mortgages. But it's actually the acceleration that actually drives house prices. Now, the acceleration is the slope of that change in mortgage debt. The change in mortgage debt, if you had that S slope shape for the ratio of mortgage debt to GDP, then the change in mortgage debt, the new mortgages will peak at the halfway point on the S-curve and then go down. So you've got a pimple there. Now, it's not the shape of the pimple that actually gives you the burst of house. It's the, slope, it, it's, it's the slope of the pimple itself. So the maximum point on that pimple, where, where you get this going up the hill and then coming back over in terms of the, the rate of change of mortgage debt, that's where house price changes peak. And that's the acceleration peak is before the uh, change peak, which is before the plateau. So when that happens, you then have house prices start to fall. When house prices start to fall, that discourages people from taking out more mortgage debt. That means the amount of uh, demand being created in the overall economy by credit, mortgage credit, declines. And with that decline, you set off a decline in total demand, and that causes the, the, the rise in unemployment. So this is one reason why asset markets tend to move ahead of the physical economy. It's because of the acceleration is what drives asset markets, whereas change is what drives the real economy. So when the housing bubbles burst, as they did in America, for example, in 2006, it's sometime after that that the economy itself falls over. And Canada, Australia, South Korea, Norway, by the looks of it, Sweden quite possibly, Belgium are all going to repeat that experience in the next one to three years. Okay, if we look right now at the U.S. housing market, we're actually seeing that the price levels have turned around. We're, we're seeing a recovery in U.S. housing prices, but it's happening at a time when mortgage debt is actually falling. So is that because of this acceleration ratio that we're seeing what yeah. seems like a counterintuitive relationship? And that's why it's so tricky, because uh, if you imagine you're, you use a car to think about how do you handle acceleration versus velocity, you can be uh, your acceleration can be falling as you were getting your velocity is rising because you're reaching the maximum speed the car can actually do. So we have this period where there can be acceleration is, is, is still positive. You are going faster per unit of time than you were beforehand, but you're going faster more slowly. So you can have rising velocity with declining acceleration. Then on the other side, if you are now tapering down, and this is the state for the uh, new mortgages in America, you can have the level of new mortgages uh, falling but falling more slowly and therefore accelerating so that's it's really quite a tricky dynamic and if you then do this analysis which i've done and i'm publishing a paper on this front i hope next year with paul omerund and uh and uh and and a guy called rickard who's our econometrician uh we've done the causal relationship using very limited but nonetheless indicative linear mathematics called Granger causality, we've shown that it's acceleration of mortgage debt causes a change in house prices, not the other way around. When you graph it for America, as I've done on my, on my Prof. Steve Keen website, you'll see it's, it looks like there's no relationship you can really discern between the level of mortgage debt and the level of house prices. When you look at the acceleration of mortgage debt and the change in house prices, it's almost like you've got a glove, a hand inside a glove. They fit so well. And at the moment, uh, mortgage debt in America is accelerating, even though uh, its ratio to debt to GD, mortgage debt is is flatlining, or only slightly rising, and that's what's giving you the rise in house prices. And they have actually gone past the previous peak. Wow. Well, Steve, every interview with you is like drinking economics from a fire hose, is the metaphor that I use. But I, I want to ask you a question on a totally different topic because. 
I, I really enjoy your perspective and how down to earth and connected to reality your views are, and as opposed to the neoclassical econo- economics crowd that doesn't seem to be in touch. But I was actually shocked watching the Real Vision television interview where you were on the other side of the microphone. Uh, interviewing Dr. Michael Hudson, who uh, also is a Ph.D. in economics. In theory, the two of you guys, you're both Ph.D.s. You're kind of representatives of academia in a sense. At one point, Hudson quips that he basically has his Ph.D. because it's the union card, as he put it, that you need to be taken seriously. But he goes on to say that he learned nothing useful in studying for his Ph.D. and everything useful that he knows he learned by actually working in financial markets. And I know that you've had uh, some very outspoken views that neoclassical e- e- economists are just not in touch with reality. What is the root cause here? How is it possible that uh, academic finance could be so out of touch with the real world? And what's, what's the cause and how could we fix it? Well, it really goes back to ideology and 19th century uh, contests over capitalism versus socialism, because when you had uh, if, if you wanted to swing the praises of capitalism these days, you'd sing the capacity of capitalism to innovate. That's clearly the advantage it had over the Soviet system. But when you go back to the 19th century, uh, Marx was criticising capitalism on the basis of exploiting workers, taking the previous classical theory as the basis for doing that. The neoclassicals began in the 1870s. They stole some ideas from earlier researchers or earlier uh, ideologues back in the early uh, early 1800s, so particularly Jean-Baptiste Say, but also um, uh, Cor- um, uh, uh, Corno. Uh, they argued that uh, capitalism is all about maximising the utility of people, uh, and it's all about reaching equilibrium. And they left out uh, to actually do the mathematics to try to work out whether a multi-market system could reach equilibrium on its own. Volra left out non-equilibrium trades, left out money, etc., etc., uh, but what he saw was the vision of a perfectly self-regulating economy with no concentration of power and no need for coercion. Now, fundamentally, that's a vision of an anarchist society. It's saying the market is the ultimate anarchist governing system. You don't need uh, politicians. You don't need regulations. You don't need compulsion. Leave it to the market. The law reaches lovely equilibrium. And that becomes a beautiful, seductive vision for young, particularly male, nerdish uh, men who end up going into a, uh, doing an economics degree, and they actually love that vision. They become dedicated to it. They really become zealots for that vision of capitalism rather than analysts of what actually exists as capitalism. And given that nature, they drive out anything which is an alternative perspective. So if you read Schumpeter, who talks about the instability of capitalism, if you read the evolutionary economists uh, in, in, in general, if you read Marx in particular, uh, you get a, a vision of capitalism they don't like and they drive that vision out. So what you get is inculcation of a vision based on an incredibly stylized model which emphasizes stability and equilibrium as the strong major attractions of capitalism, when in fact instability and innovation are its main features and strengths. And, and that religion is what you learn if you do a university degree. You only learn the other stuff if you go looking in the netherworld. You look for the people and and the the bookshelves and economics they don't put onto the uh, the reading lists, and that's where you find the good value. I was a bit luckier than Michael. I had a brilliant uh, historian of economic thought called Ted Wheelwright, who was my lecturer in uh, my third year as undergraduate, and just exposed me to this enormous range of of writing that I hadn't learned through my mainstream courses, and I then uh, read further in that area. Michael, in a similar sense, I uh, got a couple of leads, in particular in America's case, learned about the original protectionist uh, lobby in America, which really was the, the, their success in policy is really why America managed to industrialize so well in the 19th century. And he learned that literature. So we taught ourselves out of school, so to speak. And anybody who gets taught in school and swallows the stuff uh, is, is lost to reality. Well, it's really depressing that if you want to learn all about economics that relate to the real world, it's so hard to learn that from the university system. But I'm very, very interested to know more about what you are doing, because I think you, you described yourself as perhaps the world's first crowdfunded uh, economist with the new work that you're doing to basically provide economics education on Patreon. So please tell our listeners what that project is about. 
Yeah, well, it's it's really it's it's quite funny. I think in some ways we're winning, finally winning the war over the over the theory of capitalism with the failure of the neoclassicals and the success of the non-orthodox monetary non-equilibrium approach that I take and that Michael also takes. But as we're winning the war, we're losing one of the crucial battles, and that is that the only way that non-orthodox economics has survived the the push that's been pushed by the mainstream over the last 40 years is we get jobs in the low-ranked universities where they couldn't be bothered getting positions anyway. So ironically, if you want to get a good education in economics, go to a poorly rated university. Places like the University of Utah, for example, uh, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, uh, the in, in, in American ones I'm using here, the New School for Social Research, the and the... Um, uh, you, you, the uh, University of uh, Massachusetts Amherst, those are about the only places you'll get a non-conventional education in economics in America. Now, what's happened in the English, in the uh, Anglo world, Australia and, and England in particular, is that neoliberal policies have dominated education reform, and actually a better word for reform is deform, uh, and these policies have said, well, let's turn it more into, let's turn the university into a marketplace. So what they've done, what they did first of all in Australia back in 2012, and they repeated in England in 2014, was that there were controls set by the bureaucrats on how many positions each university could offer for humanities subjects, science subjects, and so on. And in an attempt to make it, inverted commas, more like a market, the bureaucrats said, let's abolish those controls and let universities decide how many positions they want to offer. Now, a market, to be a genuine market, requires informed consumers. High school students are the ones who buy university degrees. They haven't got a clue what a university is about. They're only ever going to buy one in their lives. They haven't sampled 500. You know, they prefer Shiraz to uh, Pinot Grigio. You know, they, they haven't got become informed consumers at all. So their response to that was to say, oh, if a high-ranked university offers me a position, it must be better than the lower-ranked university. So what that meant was the, the tenuous hold on academic positions that non-orthodox thinkers like I, I had in universities like Kingston was eliminated and because students were poached by the higher rank universities in the UK. So our K Kingston's intake has gone from 22,000 students to 15 over a three or four year period. It's now financially stretched, can't afford the expense of having me do my public, uh, uh, public intellectual role in economics. So I faced either four times the teaching load, which would eliminate my capacity to extend the theory and to educate the public, or I had to find my three quarters of my own salary. So I'm doing that with Patreon, and the intention ultimately is to build an online education service of people who really want to learn about economics from a non-orthodox point of view and don't have time to go to university and won't go, of course, to the, to the low-ranked ones anyway. So I intend setting up an online, what I'm calling Keen, uh, online realistic economics program using Patreon. And it's off to a reasonable start. I've got about one third of the way that I need to go before I can uh, become completely independent of the university sector. And then beyond that, start developing my Minsky software and beyond that, start um, hiring other members of the non-orthodox community to really, really teach economics extremely well and critically on the web. Well, I think that's an absolutely fantastic idea. I think the entire university system should be replaced by web-based online learning that relates to the real world. So I think you're doing pioneering work, and I'm very excited to check it out myself. Unfortunately, we are out of time, so let's go very quickly. The website is profstevekeen.com. We'll have a link in the Research Roundup email to that. The book is Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis by Professor Steve Keen, available now in the UK only, soon to be available in the rest of the world. We'll get a link to the order page on Amazon as soon as it's available to the rest of the world. And for the new online education through Patreon, what's the URL, Steve, in order for our listeners to find out more? The usual www.patreon.com slash profstevekeen. Steve, I can't thank you enough for another fantastic interview, and we look forward to getting you back on the program in a few months. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com.